questions. Please remember this lecture is not intended to be medical advice. And any, and any questions that you ask, I ask that they not be specific questions about your loved ones. We are fortunate to have Dr. Chad McDonald here tonight, and I have the honor of introducing him all to you. Dr. McDonald is the Chief Medical Officer of Intercommunity Healthcare, which is a local mental health authority in East Hartford. It also operates the largest withdrawal management facility in the state, as well as residential and outpatient behavioral health and addiction medicine. Intercommunity emphasizes whole person health care and the integration of primary care and behavioral health services. Dr. McDonald is board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine. He is also the author of Cut the Doctor Speak, which aims to help to better help people understand their own health care and non-medical language. He recently released the second edition of Cut the Doctor Speak with additional content on alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder. He continues to write regularly, and his articles can be read at cupofdoctorspeak.com. Dr. McDonald is passionate about destigmatizing behavioral health and substance use treatment. Dr. McDonald will now present Reading Through the Evidence, Cannabis as a Landscape of Mental Health and Addiction Treatments. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening. I, I always like to start out figuring out where everyone is in terms of content in the audience. So professionally, show of hands, how many people work in healthcare? Any branch of healthcare, okay. Okay, and then of those that do work in healthcare, how many work in behavioral health or addiction? Okay, pretty much the same, a little, a little down, great. And the rest, the rest of you here out of pure interest. And so I just like to know who the room is so I can speak in a way that is meaningful for everyone. So if I throw in little clinical add-ins here and there, you can just go la 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 and ignore it. But uh, I'll try to limit that, okay? Well, tonight I'm talking about cannabis and it's, it's a tricky topic Especially as now we live in a state where it's recreational for adults to use it. And, you know, there's so much information out there. It's hard enough for healthcare providers to keep up with um, on what actually has been proven, what hasn't been proven. So my hope tonight is to go over the latest and to really come at it with an objective standpoint. I don't have an iron in the fire of being cannabis is the answer for everything. And I'm also not anti-cannabis. So I hope to kind of present things in an objective. Um, little slide, I already had a good introduction, and that's what this lecture is and isn't. Um, this lecture is not a soapbox to say that it should be used for this, or should be used for that, or should never be used, so I hope that comes across. Cannabinoids, a big fancy word, it just means a family of chemicals that are uh, found in cannabis. It's, all of them do different things, and there's a ton of them. And the most common ones that, that you see and you've likely heard about, THC and CBD, those are the two most common ones, and largely because they're, in terms of, of, of uh, weight and, and the amount that's present in a typical cannabis plant, those are the most um, prolific. They also have the most evidence, and they're, they're, they're two of them that we know the most about. The THC is, is really what um, a lot of people um, seeking out cannabis are, are historically looking for. It is a psychoactive component, but it does help with pain and it does help with nausea, especially study for nausea in conjunction with chemotherapy and cancer treatments. CBD is, is seen to be largely non-psychoactive, um, and there's question, I put a question mark everywhere when I, I don't feel comfortable saying, it relieves anxiety, because there's actually a lot of evidence to the opposite uh, for some people that it can worsen anxiety, um, pain, and inflammation. Um, so the latter two, there's more evidence for. And then there's um, some other cannabinoids here that aren't as popular. Though CBG is an interesting one, because it's kind of like the grandfather uh, chemical of uh, many different members of the cannabis family and it can kind of break down into a couple other can uh, cannabinoids. So it's kind of an interesting one to look at in terms of time-releasing things and uh, kind of double-dipping. So 
Those are the four big ones, and then there's, we geeked out on it, there's hundreds of them out there. Hundreds of them. So we're not going to go there. That's not what we're doing today. But how do they work? It's, it's interesting to me. Um, we have a whole system of our body that is built for cannabinoids. It's just so strange to think about. In the same way that we have a system that's built to deal with opioids. Like, it, it's so strange how medicine and chemicals intertwine with the human body. So we do have receptors built for uh, cannabinoids. And the two that have been studied the most are CB1, CB2. It's a very simplistic way to look at it. CB1 are the little cannabinoid grabbers primarily in the brain, and then CB2 primarily in the, in the immune system. And so um, and that's about it. You can think of them like most substances. They're like a key that goes into a receptor or a chemical grabber, and it turns on that key, and it causes nerves to fire and chemicals to go. Kind of just the way that they work. Uh, just a, a very brief history. I'm not going to dive into it much, but you know, there's a there's a reason that that, that humans have endocannabinoid systems, and, and and they've been used by humans for millennia, across cultures, across a, nearly every continent, right? I don't think Antarctica has any <laughs> cannabis, but <laughs> no, they grow there natively, right? Um, but uh, you know, every continent, um, ancient uses used in rituals, used for pain relief, used as an anti uh, to help with nausea. Um, and then in Western medicine, we started using it and then kind of took off in the early 1900s. And then we put it on the prohibition list along with pinball and all sorts of other interesting things that we decided to outlaw in the 30s. And then um, time went on. And then we decided to regulate it. And it really, non-medical use was discouraged. And that was kind of in our... 50s-ish, and then the 60s, 70s, it became a symbol of activism. And though, and we, we'll get into this a little bit, the cannabis of the 60s and 70s was a totally different marijuana uh, than we look at today. It's, it's uh, apples and oranges in terms of content. Um, but then we had the war on drugs uh, that was, you know, cannabis, marijuana was part of it. And, uh, and then we had the medical cannabis movement that started in the 90s, largely in the Northwest and um, in Colorado, which gave way to medical um, legalization. And uh, California picked up and ran with that and kind of became the, the, the main um, political force for other states. And then um, now we have adult recreational legal legalization, and it's, it's quite uh, normal if you look across the nation now. The question becomes, though, so we have this, and it's legal, but how does it affect mental health? And that's what we're focusing on today. Um, what we do know, and it's, I, I hope it's not news to anyone, you, you know, believe it or not, you can become addicted to marijuana. You can become addicted to cannabis. And people say, oh, it's just a flower and all that. Is it the most common addiction that I treat people with that come into my clinic? No. You know, all I, I, I treat addictions, and I've treated less than a dozen in the last you know, 10, 11, 12 years myself. And, um, and I tend to see quite a few <laughs> compared to my, my colleagues. So. Um, it's not a common one, and yet, when it's bad, it's, it's, it's life-altering and debilitating. So it, there is potential for addiction. And then future directions, we just need to really understand its impacts better before we do too much, though it kind of feels like the barn door is open, and now we kind of have to, feel, have to figure out how to, how to deal with it and what we should do. I wanted to get a little perspective on, globally, it's, it's used by approximately 2.5% of the world's population, okay? And then if you look at the United States at recent data, this is SAMHSA. This is a major mental health organization for the U.S. And their most recent estimate, 2020, that's of use, said 22.2 million Americans used cannabis in the last month at that point with an increasing trend for medical purposes. And then I did some math 
which wasn't perfect because I used the current population in the U.S. and used that, but it came out to about 6.3% of Americans um, today are using, uh, have used cannabis in the last month. And that's more than two and a half times the global rate. Okay. We'll get a little more into that. Um, the, the, a key point I want everyone to leave with is that forgetting cannabis, forgetting addiction, Scientific studies, science says, well, again, experts in the field can read the same paper and come away with very different conclusions. So it's important, even if you're not a scientist by definition, it's important that you learn to just kind of think about things like, well, how many people were in that study? And what did they really do? And what did they really find out? Um, I wanted to kind of prove a point here um, to help you kind of start thinking in those terms. So this is an actual article that came out. Um, this article, what's their date here? November 2023. And the title is Improved Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Symptoms and Related Sleep Disturbances After Initiation of Medical Marijuana Use, Evidence from a Prospective Single-Arm Pilot Study. Really long title just means they looked at it for PTSD and how it helps with sleep, okay? And the single arm study is a way of saying for people that are inclined to do science and statistics that, you know, we only looked at a little bit here, but, you know, pop media, we don't, you know, uh, and news, they, we don't look at it that way all the time. So if you look at an agency, and this is not knocking normal, who's done amazing things for medical marijuana and things like that, but they tend to be a very pro-cannabis organization. So their response right after this came out in November 2023, cannabis use associated with improved symptoms, better sleep in patients suffering with PTSD. I mean, when you look at the two titles, not terribly wrong, right? And the article goes on, um, but, and, and when you read their article, they say, oh, it reduces the PTSD symptoms, it improves sleep, duration, efficiency, positive mental health changes, okay? And then if you look at the <laughs> flip side, the anti-cannabis camp read the same paper. And they said, um, you only looked at 15 people and you didn't even have a control group. Control group is a fancy term for you know, people you're not doing anything with and you're just watching them to see under the same conditions Without cannabis, did they pretty much end up the same way? Wasn't done. Okay, so right out of the gate, you see those two things, you're like, 15? So you can be thinking about that. When you, when you hear about new papers coming out, 15,000, you have my attention. That's a big study if it's controlled. 15, I mean, that's what? We could do two of those in here with nearly, right? That's 15, not a big number. And, uh, and then minimally reduced PTSD symptoms, mild improvement. If you really look at the numbers, it wasn't massive improvement. They did actually, the authors of that paper say, cannabis can impair cognitive function and judgment, and there is danger of addiction. And the authors of that paper said all of these things. And, and then to add to it, the anti-cannabis camp's argument, you know, with federal restrictions, say, as physicians, we operate in this world of we have to abide by federal guidelines where cannabis still is not federally legal. It's a state by state decision. So I'm practicing in Connecticut. I really can't say, oh, you should go use cannabis. I can't do that if I'm operating under the federal law. Um, so it, it's very tricky. So in most regions of the country, people can't even go around and use this, even if they decide that the 15 is, is okay. So our conclusions, limited at best, okay? so. Um, if you look at overall, um, I, I found this to be quite objective, and this was by someone named Steam Camp. Um, they said that an open label and observational trials have concluded that cannabis use is associated with worse treatment outcomes and concluded that known risks of marijuana thus currently outweigh known benefits for PTSD. A uh, further study of cannabinoids and other drugs that enhance the function of endocannabinoids is warranted. Now, again, this is based on big numbers of people. Does that mean that there's maybe some people in this room that had very crippling PTSD and cannabis has changed their life? I'm not arguing with that. That's like, it worked for you. So how can I 
argue against that. But if we're looking at the population at large, most reasonable middle of the road um, healthcare providers will recommend something along this, this line at this point. Okay, a little bit on cannabis and mental health, the risks. There are risks. There's risks of becoming dependent. There's risks of worsening anxiety. There's risks of mood instability, not thinking as straight. And then there's benefits. Cannabis, especially CBD. Remember, that's that, that one that's more body affecting, not so much the mind, not psychoactive, as we call it. It's being researched for various mental health conditions, which it's seen as more favorable because you know, even people taking large amounts of CBD, they, they don't get altered. It's not the high of, of THC. So um, you know, even some studies, and I didn't put this on here, but well, a little bit, I guess, some neuroprotective, uh, protecting the nerve benefits of, of CBD and some of those other cannabinoids. They're, they've even used it in conditions where, let's say like children, where the typical medication don't work to help their seizures. Uh, reputable hospitals, you know, Mass General, they are using CBD and cannabinoids to help treat those pediatric patients. So this isn't to say there's no benefit, it's just not super clear yet for some conditions. And we're gonna go into some of those conditions. Um, if I had to speak though to anxiety, I would say CBD is most promising, most promising. Uh, versus THC, it seems like, um, and it just makes sense because it acts on a lot of the little chemical messengers that are used with many of the meds that, that we will treat anxiety with. And those are called like serotonin, that's one of the chemicals. So I'm not surprised. Um, PTSD, this is a tough one. The nightmares and the sleep disturbances again, <laughs> and a 15, it helped them a little bit. Um, and there's some evidence that can back that up. This one has, this one's a little, little less evidence in my opinion, um, because most of the studies they looked at, at higher THC and not CBD too. And there's so much crossover of the anxiety with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, depression, depression's one where, aside from CBD or maybe there's, there are some strains, and we won't get too far into that, but there are some strains that tend to be a little more elevating for people. So if you have someone with, very, with depression where they're like stuck in bed depression, with the right strain and with some advice maybe from a, a pharmacist who knows cannabinoids like at a dispensary, they may be able to find something that can help with that. But in general, most strains uh, don't have great evidence uh, for depression. And then there's the argument that I deal with a lot in the clinics. So that, you know, marijuana is just a flower. It's, you can get all upset about a flower that you see in the, you know, in my urine test. Well, there is cannabis addiction. It's full-fledged addiction. And so that might be a good thing to explain. So what's the difference between, see, in medicine and, and in behavioral health, we like to split apart. So people can use med, uh, marijuana or cannabis and then people can abuse, and then people can be dependent on it, and then people can have an addiction, right? It's a spectrum. Just because you use cannabis or marijuana once a year doesn't mean that you have a cannabis addiction. There's certain criteria. And so, oop, so we have all these criteria. And really what it comes down to, is it, is it getting in the way of your life? Is, is your use of blank, we'll say cannabis here, but um, fentanyl, cocaine, whatever, is it getting in the way of your life? Is it affecting your relationships? Is it affecting your work? Is it affecting your mood? Uh, is it affecting your health and you can't stop? Are you having to use more and more? There's certain criteria that we look at that help us go, yeah, this is more than just use. This is more than even abuse. This is addiction. So. There is that spectrum. So with cannabis, you can definitely, I'm here to tell you, become addicted to cannabis and it can uh, be debilitating. Um, and it is a tricky one to treat because we don't, you know, 
for opioid um, addiction or use disorder, I have treatments that are proven for that. They're FDA approved. Alcohol, I've got it. Cannabis, nope. We'll talk a little bit about that. There's nothing that's FDA approved. So it's trickier, you know, in some ways than dealing with um, the, some of those other addictions. Okay, here's a big busy chart. Um, we're gonna cut the doctor speak here because you can't even read it, let alone, we're not gonna get into that. But, so I cut it down. This is the important part and our take home is just right here. And it says CBD, THC, cannabinoids can increase or decrease how well some common medications work. It's kind of crazy to think about. Um, and there's charts like this you can find online, wherever. Um, this isn't just in medical journals. But a lot of these medications aren't super rare. I'm guessing, I'm guessing there's people in this room on some of these, and definitely we have loved ones on some of these. Um, some of them are for depression, anxiety. Some of them are blood thinners. Some of them are heart medications. Some are antibiotics. Some are for uh, fungal infections, seizure disorders. And so what happens is um, a lot of the medications and chemicals we take into our body get broken down by the liver into something else. And when cannabis goes in, whether it's you know THC, CBD, any of the others, it goes in and it kind of gets in the way. And it can get in the way in a way where more of the chemical, <laughs> more, of, more of the medication that you're taking for a condition that you need, you're gonna get too much of it, or it could get in the way where it's kind of taking up all those grabber receptors so that it can't, the medication can't do what it needs to do. So it's important that if you or anyone that you know um, are, are using cannabinoids and medication to, to bring it up, especially these days. I mean, we have adult recreational dispensaries. You might as well just be straight with your healthcare provider on it because, you know, given that the dispensaries are all integrated into a state database, the, the, your health record already knows. So you might as well just bring it up so your provider can check your medications. Um, all right, incidence and prevalence of cannabis use. So we kind of got into this. I won't belabor the point. Um, but I do want to point out one very interesting trend. 12 to 20-year-olds um, use the most cannabis. May not be a surprise. The interesting ones right here. Incidence in states with legalized medical or adult use cannabis, 7.8%. So people that use... Um, there's more cannabis use in states where it's legalized, but this also crosses over down here. Uh, so let's see, where's my statistic? It might be on a later slide. But the take home point is if you live in a state that has legalized cannabis, you're much higher rate of developing a cannabis disorder. So just because it's legalized doesn't mean it, that addictiveness goes away, it actually increases. Um, which is kind of unfortunate. And um, cannabis use has gone up 4.5 fold, so 450% increase since 2016. So a lot. It's a big jump. Is it the end of the world? Is the world ending? Uh, I don't think so, but that's a big jump. And it says something about how new and novel it is for us and that we kind of need to learn how to cope with it in mental health especially. So psychosis, this is a fancy term that we use. It basically means when people lose touch with reality. Um, we may hear or see things that other people don't see or hear or think things that aren't real. We may think people are after us. That's called psychosis. And one thing that's an unfortunate reality, it's been proven repeatedly, um, that high doses of THC can worsen psychosis. So if you, let's say you were wired at birth with your DNA to kind of lean toward having psychosis, having schizophrenia, or, or having that happen, and then you add marijuana or cannabis to the mix, <sighs> skyrockets. It's like adding gas to a fire. Um, so that's, that's a known thing, not even really a debate. That's a known element. 
So if there's any, so what, how do we turn this into what I call reasonable, neutral, objective guidelines for people in current psychosis? If they've never had cannabis ever, don't recommend medical cannabis. If they're already taking cannabis, just minimize the THC dose as much, as much as you can. And I would say the nice thing about having dispensaries and legalization is that part of the dispensaries being able to open is that they have to have pharmacy services. They have to have a pharmacist on staff that understands cannabinoids. And I would encourage you and loved ones to take advantage of that so that if you get in a situation where it's like, well, cannabis is in this situation and it's not going anywhere, have a sit down with them. They, they're required to consult with you if you request it and to really pick a strain that's going to help and not hurt you, okay? Just a little tidbit. Uh, clinical implications, you just need to be really careful. Um, and even if, let's say, say someone gets cancer and they're it's gonna be a rough chemo go, and we're talking about cannabis, just consider the history of psychosis, because I mean, the last thing that you need in that situation is also becoming psychotic. Um, and so we would wanna steer away from higher THC compounds. Um, another area that's been proven that we, we want to avoid is uh, cannabis use during pregnancy when breastfeeding, or um, in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, it's been shown repeatedly cannabinoids do cross over into breast milk and they tend to stay for, at le they're detectable uh, at least for six days, if not longer. Um, so that, that one is one where we would advise against. And uh, pregnancy is, is, a, is a tricky area in medicine with any compound because it's not like you really get parents that say, oh, I'm pregnant, sign me up for this medical trial with my kid. No, it doesn't happen. So. Um, the pregnancy angle, less evidence, but the breastfeeding very clearly. Drug-drug um, interactions, we talked about that. The big names of, of medications you may have heard of are things like Coumadin, which is a blood thinner used for a lot of conditions. Phenobarbital, which is used for seizure and some psychiatric conditions. Digoxin, a heart medication, and a lot of antibiotics and, uh, and antifungus medicine. And, um, and then combining cannabinoids with alcohol or other uh, downers like uh, benzodiazepines like Xanax and Ativan, all those downers can slow your breathing to the point where you can stop breathing. Um, not just with cannabis alone is that usually a thing unless it's very high doses, and, and, um, but that's, that one's pretty rare. So then I've gotten on my soapbox, I talked about all this, and then it's like harm reduction, right? It's everywhere. It seems like I drive down the street and it's like a new bank, a new dispensary, <laughs> a new dentist. It's like predictable, right? They're everywhere. So, so given this reality, let me take a step back. So when I was uh, practicing, let's say, six years ago, and I would have a patient come in, and they're just stopped using heroin. It was heroin back then, fentanyl now. And, and I would see um, a marijuana on the panel, then it was a conversation because it wasn't even, it's not even legal. Like why, you know, you don't need this right now. Well now it's like, well it's legal. <laughs> and then if we're talking harm reduction and I, if I can help somebody not use fentanyl, then I'm gonna put up with some marijuana because what am I gonna do about it? I gotta, so in a sense that helped addiction, but it's also, it's not going anywhere. So it's kind of like, well, what do we do with this? So I usually recommend being very careful about their um, administration routes. Uh, and I'll talk about why shortly. I recommend um, being very careful with, um, to avoid dose stacking, which tends to occur, which just means you kind of get so too deep too fast in your dose. So it's the classic story here about people trying an edible for the first time and it doesn't start working so they have more and they have more next thing you know it's two hours later and they just like take me to the hospital. Not pleasant. So that's called dose stacking. That also happens with what are called dabs and waxes which are just kind of the, the very, very concentrated um, waxy uh, compounds that can come off of cannabis plants or be extracted. 
Um, so I'll, if, if they're like, I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it, I say, okay, fine, then just take a very, very low dose then. Um, and you know, if you have to, increase slowly, uh, like over the order of days. And then limit the uh, doing nicotine additives. Uh, patients will sometimes add tobacco because they don't want to get too sleepy. And it's like, well, we're trying to get away from smoking anything. And then there's all sorts of papers now that are flavored. And so it's encouraging people to avoid those, avoid mixing, like I said, uh, benzos, Xanax, Ativan type medication, alcohol, and cannabinoids. Operating machinery, I mean, you can get a DUI from smoking. I mean, if you, if the officer, if you're very clearly impaired, you'll get a DUI just like with alcohol. And then making sure to store cannabis products in a safe place. Too many kids have too much access now, and um, that's like a whole other uh, conversation. But adolescent and and pediatric minds especially are a lot of damage can take place with early cannabis because our brains aren't even developed till we're like 23, 25. So it can really mess it up. So this is an interesting point, and most people aren't aware of this. And I worked in the field. I didn't even learn about this until I did a deep dive myself. Um, cannabis smoke contains higher levels of tar and carcinogens than tobacco smoke. So if you have this, this amount of tobacco, pure tobacco, no additives, you have this amount of cannabis, pure cannabis, no additives. You have more tar and more carcinogen production just due to the presence of all the extra crystals and compounds that are found in cannabis naturally. And to add to it, and this isn't me just talking off of it, like there's been not just this study from 1991, there's also one from 2014 that went very in-depth. Um, it also has to do with how when people tend to vape or smoke cannabis, it's a deeper inhalation and it's held longer. So it tends to get deeper into the lungs. So there's even more tar deposition. And um, yeah, I think the exact number I believe in the 2014 was uh, four times the tar and three times the carcinogens. And unfortunately, even a, a lot of the vaping devices um, they, they don't have a temperature control. So the temperatures at which it's being vaped, it's up in the very high kind of carcinogen making zone of the temperature range. So it can be more harmful than tobacco for your lungs. Um, and then a lot of it has to do with how it's inhaled. Um, and also some of that is from WHO, um, World Health Organization. Um, yeah, I already talked about that. Don't know how that one snuck in. Cannabis and cognitive disorders. Uh, used in dementia. I just don't think the evidence is there yet, personally. Um, especially for THC. Uh, it's not there. You could argue CBD, maybe. There's, I could go either way on that one. Um, I, yeah, this one's not enough evidence to speak on. Um, Misconception, we kind of talked about that. A lot of people think that cannabis, you can't get addicted. Well, you can. Okay, but how does this happen? So just like with all addictions, I used this to just kind of give you a framework for all addictions. You start using it, you, you use cannabis, it alters your system that you were born with that can handle cannabis. It makes it so that you need more to get the same effect. That affects your brain chemistry in other ways, outside of the can cannabinoids. We're talking about your mood. We're talking about your anxiety. And then as you get exposed to more and more cannabis, this whole system gets further altered. So it's a cycle. And these are features, this isn't unique to cannabis. This is the same thing with I could do this with cocaine, opioids. The only difference would be which system, how is it being handled by the brain and, and the body. Who's most at risk for cannabis addiction then? Okay, if it's a real thing, who's at risk? People that start using early, young, use a lot, and it's in the genetics. So 
when I think about the cases that I had where it, they were very, very addicted, it was accepted in their family. It's like, oh yeah, we all get together and we smoke. You know, it's just like been part of our family. Um, so there is a genetic component, but it has largely to do with when and how much. Signs I mentioned, needing more, getting cravings, can't quit, and you're having problems in your life, and um, I'll get right to you in just a second. Use despite problems, and then um, the treatments, behavioral health and behavioral therapy, talk therapy, talking to someone, far and away our best recommendation, pretty much for every addiction, although some addictions we do have a medical component that helps a lot, um, but especially with cannabis addiction, and then sometimes there's some literature out there that compounds, if we're using high CBD compounds for people that, have, that are very addicted to very large amounts of THC, that that can help the cannabinoid system um, be a little more calm. And then there's a, a supplement, there's a chemical our, in our bodies called N-acetylcysteine that we use. That also has some evidence, and um, I've had some patients that used that with good effect too. But the take home message is, it's not hopeless, you know, it's, I think about of my, what did they say, 10 or 12, probably eight to 10 were able to, to uh, move on with their lives and get it under control. So there is hope, it's not a hopeless thing. And there was a question in the back, yeah. Well, I don't know if it's a question, but maybe a comment. Yeah. Uh, would, you, would you also say that perhaps trauma could be a big risk factor too for getting yeah, pretty much for all of the, what we call the substance use disorders, all, all of the addictions. It's pretty typical, unfortunately, as I'm gathering history, I just directly, I've learned to just ask about trauma because it's, it's rare that it's not there. Yeah, it doesn't matter the substance. And some substances, much, much more, much, much more. So then I know I have to really ask in those cases, but um, yeah, good question. What's California sober? Have people heard about this? This is kind of <laughs> this kind of gets to what I was what I was hinting at a little bit of. So California sober. What does that mean? It means avoiding most substances, but still using cannabis, marijuana sometimes, and sometimes a little alcohol, and and considering that sober. Now. <sighs> there's different levels of so of sobriety, right? And if you think about uh, even <laughs> even when we think about group settings for therapy, you have your 12-step programs, right? Which historically have been sobriety, 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 complete sobriety, you can't touch cannabis, you can't touch alcohol, you can't touch anything because sobriety, sobriety, right? And that's fine. That's a great stance for sobriety. Then you have other groups like even some smart recovery groups or some of the, some of the other um, similar groups um, don't take that, ab that absolute stand. It's more of a harm reduction model. So it's, <laughs> it's a tricky situation. When I have somebody who's, you know, I was, I was injecting 30 bags of fentanyl a day and now I just use marijuana twice a month. It's kind of hard to like fault that person. You know, like it's, <sighs> and yet there's people out there that would say, you know, uh, you know, that's nothing to joke about. They shouldn't be using marijuana twice a month. So it's, it's definitely a, a subjective area. But this is, gro this is major common uh, for what I see. Patients that are able to stay sober long term these days, a lot of people are California sober. Um, and why? Well, it gives them an outlet. You know, a, a, lot of our, a lot of us and a lot of our patients and a lot of our family members got into substance addictions because we wanted to control how we feel on our terms, right? And so to still have an outlet for that through cannabis or through alcohol can be a means of stress reduction while we're still learning different um, ways to cope with things through more uh, less chemical-based and more um, behavioral health means. Um, but it is risky because when we drink, when we use cannabinoids, we are not thinking at 100%. And we let down our guard. And I can't tell you how many relapse stories of, oh, I just started with one drink, and then next thing I know, I wake up, and I don't know where I am, and I had a massive relapse. Happens all the time. Um, so uh, 
for patients and providers, you need to dialogue on it. You need to consider holistic wellness, come up with personalized plans. You've got to look at the person's overall picture of recovery. Like I said, I've <laughs> the days of, it, it, even 10 years ago, it would be common practice if someone was in the methadone or suboxone program, if they came in and their urine had marijuana, they'd be kicked out of that program. And now I think we're at a, a more reasonable place where we're kind of seeing that that's, that's a bit harsh, like people are trying to get help and we're gonna uh, you know, do that. But it's, like I said, it's, it's a slippery slope. So gotta, gotta talk it out and at least have to have that conversation of, okay, if we choose to have a drink now and then, we need to realize we have to be on high alert. Let's, let's talk to our friends, let's build some accountability, let's really truly limit it. And uh, I don't know, something along those lines. References, um, for those that are interested, I, this slide this slide is kind of dirty. I had in improved one, but um, yeah, thank you for listening. Share this with friends and I'll do just kind of a Q&A within reason um, with you guys. Um, yeah, go ahead. Is there any way to get a copy of the presentation? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I'll give, the, cl the cleaned up version, I had actually made all the references nice to read, but I did it after I submitted it, so it was, <laughs> that was on me. I apologize. How do we get a copy of the presentation? Uh, so um, we can certainly, we're going to be posting uh, the presentation on our recording of the video on YouTube, and so we can put a, um, the slides over that. Okay. okay. So uh, we could uh, go what the NAMI website? Um, you could, or you could email um, the NAMI Farmington Valley email on there and just request a copy of the. Okay. NAMI, all one word, NAMI Farmington Valley? Yeah. Is that one NAMI FV. Yeah. Yeah. NAMI FV? No, it's NAMI Farmington Valley that yeah. Okay. Yeah, NAMI Farmington Valley. And you also said that uh, marijuana in the 60s and 70s is different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How is it different? The content. So back in the 60s, 70s, before that, we, our, our knowledge of genetics wasn't super great. And we, you know, people would create a crop out in the field and maybe they would think to cross with other strains. Now there's people whose job is to just sit down and figure out which of the plants are being crossed with what to take it from Oh, no, 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 15% THC is not high enough. We need to be 30. 30 is not enough. We need to be 40. So the strains now, um, 10 times the potency of THC than, than in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. yeah. So when people say, it's just not the same, it's not. It's totally a different plant. Totally a different plant. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Did you come across... Um, anyone who's predisposed to psychosis, formed in psychosis, using antipsychotics to offset what was to, and enabling them to use marijuana mm -hmm. to, and use antipsychotics to prevent them from going into a psychosis. Oh, okay. So in the, yeah, so is it, um, someone that already was on antipsychotics and then started marijuana, or did they start marijuana and then they? Started marijuana. And then, oh, and then start antipsychotics. Antipsych yeah, yeah, unfortunately common, yes. And that's why as healthcare providers and in behavioral health, it's so important we ask about substance use, because it's a very important piece of the puzzle. Because out of the gate, oh, you use, you know, you. You use a, a quarter of an ounce of marijuana per week and you're hearing things. Let's delve into that. And maybe it's just reducing that amount or eliminating marijuana alone would be enough. Because sometimes the psychosis won't even be there until the marijuana use begins. And that will kind of turn it on and make those genes active. A lot of times it'll go away or get much less, but sometimes it's there to stay. That's why it's kind of it's a dangerous um, game if you if you know that you have family members with um, the history. What if it's reversed and they have the psychosis first, then use the marijuana to medicate mm. 
Yeah, they might need an even higher dose of antipsychotics and need more medication just to cover up something that could maybe be lessened by just reducing the cannabis use. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm in education, primarily yeah. um, in younger college and into high school. And my question is, do we have a lot of data on when, when you had the intakes and you're talking to somebody about their use, whether they're getting it from, are you seeing higher incidents in places that are getting clean uh, marijuana from say a store versus maybe still street marijuana that might be laced with fentanyl and things like that? Do you have any of that data? Or is there an assumption made that, you know, there might not be clean? We have data that the challenge with it is, so I can tell you anecdotally what I see every week, every single week without fail in my clinic are people using just marijuana and then the results come back. Yeah, it has high THC, but I send it out to a fancy lab and they tell me exactly how much of everything. There's a small amount of fentanyl in there too, or there's a decent amount of fentanyl in there too. And you'd think on marijuana? But then you have to take a step back and you go, well, there's nobody really running. You don't have like a quality control guy with a hard hat walking around where, where it's being uh, cut up. So it is a big argument in favor of dispensaries because at least they're checking for, are there illicit substances in here? Required. They have to check that. Are there heavy metals? Are there fung is there fungus? Is there so at least there's some quality control there. Getting back to the statistics though, is it's a really hard study to run, right? Like, because even people that will bring in their, oh, I, I have this marijuana here, I'm curious how much fentanyl is in here. Well, where did it come from? <laughs> it's really hard to track, right? But I can tell you anecdotally, that has been one of the nice things. I would say about five years ago, four or five years ago, four years ago, it went from, being a very, very rare thing to see fentanyl in marijuana to being very common. That was kind of before the dispensaries took off. Okay. And then with the rise of dispensaries, it's becoming less of a thing, but, but then it becomes, well, I got really anxious, so my, my friend gave me a Xanax, and so I started taking the Xanax, and then he gave me more, and I've been taking it. But when I don't take it, I feel weird. And then we check it, and it's like, there's, no Xan there's zero Xanax in there, and it's just, you're taking fentanyl pills. So, it, it's, uh, and, and if you're interested in the area, you can go online and look. Very elaborate pill pressing operations. I mean, it takes, it takes microscopes, and even then, sometimes you can't tell them apart. So, it, <laughs> there you go. You look at them and you're like, what? And some of them were, I think they seized them in California, they were en route to, to, to Connecticut. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, and trying to eliminate that piece of the <coughs> retail that helps promote and distribute some of this. Yeah, yep. So if, if I'm in the harm, if I put on my harm reduction hat, I'm saying if you're going to use cannabis, go to the dispensary. It's going to cost a little more, at least you're not going to end up with who knows what. And then if don't use pills from anybody, <laughs> just don't, d don't. You could have the best intentions. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I could tell you so many stories. Okay. Um, anyone else have other questions? Seeing a higher rate of CHF. CH what? CHF. I can't pronounce oh, the whole word. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, there's a <laughs> so there's a medical condition where people get into this cycle of using so much marijuana and cannabis that they just, it causes them, to, when they don't use, to just profusely vomit and just feel terrible. Like, go to the ER vomit. Like, that bad. Not just like, oh, I'm throwing up a little. Like, out of control. And that's it. Um, we're seeing it, unfortunately, as THC has just skyrocketed. And now, with um, people doing a lot of the waxes, concentrates, dabs, you know, TikToks of watch me do a one gram dab, two gram, oh, I'm going to compete with you. And so then kids getting into it. And luckily, a lot of the dispensaries now are, are um, and I'm glad the government is cranking down on this. They're really saying, look, you guys can't be pushing these concentrates because that's where people really get into trouble. Um, especially, yeah. Dabs or what again? It's just concentrated. Think about like 
if you had a, a, a cannabis plant and you were able to kind of vacuum up all of the THC off of it and put it into a little wax, that's what a dab is. It's just a really concentrated form of THC or, or you know, cannabinoids. Like the little candy dot. <laughs> yeah, it kind of sounds like it, huh? Yeah, it's because, and yeah, and it's just, it's based on how they use it. Yeah. This is something you buy on the street? Um, yep, the street, or um, there are concentrate pens that, yeah, you can get at uh, dispensaries and things like that, and then they can be misused. Um, they're not designed to be used that way, so. So you, you, you buy a, little, a bag of little waxy balls in it, or what? Yeah, luckily, luckily, the dispensaries are limited in how much quantity they can give per person per month. But we all know those systems. There's people figure out all sorts of workarounds for these these sorts of things. But fortunately, if you get something like a concentrate, um, it's it counts you a certain number of points. We'll say toward how much you can get per month versus um, a small amount of flour. So they do break it up by how much is in it. So it's not like they're all pushing dabs, quite the opposite. The dispensaries know that in order to keep on the up and up and the government to keep happy with them, they can't be pushing out concentrate. So that's been a, a good responsible step that I've seen. How many dispensaries are there? In the I don't even know the count now. I don't even know. Do you, you, do you know? No, no, no. Oh, I was like, oh, you know. I, yeah, a couple of years ago I could have told you. I can't even tell you now. It seems like there's a lot of them now. I, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right, good point. Yeah, go ahead. Um, have you seen reduced stigma in your field? Um, have you seen, as it's become more legal, as it's become this, have you seen within your field more acceptance of, like you said, this is a way to reduce harm, to switch from this to this, as opposed to, like, I think we, I, I grew up in 46 with, it's a gateway drug, as opposed to now, like, it's literally may help people. Yeah, you know, like, yep. Like, there. <laughs> like, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, have you seen that? Has that made, um, like, how has that changed you, uh, I think, professionally with, like, finally we're at this place where we can have those conversations, or is it, yeah. you still have a lot of ill-informed people? <laughs> <laughs> yes to everything you said. <laughs> There's still a lot of ill-informed people, and there are some people, there's some people that have such crippling arthritic disease that they're going to be on a small amount of opioid for the rest of their life, no matter what. Like, unless they're going to suffer, that's going to happen. And they have shown in multiple studies, and I'm not saying I advocate this, I'm just speaking for both sides of the aisle, right, that small amounts of cannabinoids can have synergy or can work together in a, in a positive way with small amounts of opioids so that both amounts can be lesser and they can, be, they can get better pain relief. Um, again, that's still in its infancy. It's still kind of theoretical. Um, but if we're talking risk reduction, you know, keeping opioid content down, that keeps me happy. But it is, again, it's a slippery slope. Do you find the doctors are more receptive to that conversation? Yeah, it, it really depends. <laughs> depends on the doctor and the setting, right? Yeah, yeah I, uh, yeah. If you're coming to see me on a voluntary basis for an addiction consult, then we have one conversation. If you're coming court mandated and in jeopardy of losing your kids, it's a different conversation. So. And, you know, you have a terminal cancer diagnosis, it's one conversation. You have a hangnail, it's another conversation. So, um, but those conversations we are having now. So I think that gets to your point of, is, is marijuana ruining the world? No. Do we know everything that it's all of the downstream effects of negative things that, are, that it's causing? Not entirely. We're learning. We're learning. I had both of you at the same time. I don't know. Go ahead. Oh, um, so I know you said there's no FDA-approved medications for like um, addiction to cannabis. Are mm -hmm. there things like naltrexone that's used for other like urges and cravings? Like, is that used at all? Yeah, that's kind of both the fun and frustrating part of addiction medicine. Is I have my my FDA-approved toolbox where I can do things with opioids and alcohol only. And then for everything else, I have to all day, every day, have this conversation with patients of like, what we're about to do is not FDA approved, okay? And here's the studies where this helped. This is how it might help. This is how it might not help. Um, in particular, 
the, the most promising, there's really three, okay? Um, I was at a, an addiction conference in San Diego a couple years back, and it was in San Diego, so I had people even more involved in cannabis addiction than, my, than you know, I am, um, who were swearing by medications like gabapentin because it gets to the underlying anxiety issue. Okay, great. For me, logically, if I think of cannabis, if I think of THC addiction, like I think of opioid addiction, CBD makes a whole lot of sense because it's not psychoactive. It's, it's not, it doesn't affect the brain as much. It turns on those receptors involved without really turning them on negatively, psych, and, you know, in terms of the mind and the brain, but it's satisfying that, that cannabis craving. So to me, that one makes a lot of sense, um, and low risk profile. Um, and then there's like N-acetylcysteine, which you know, it kinda, it's been used for just about everything over the years. It's kind of one of those panaceas, but um, those are like the big three, um, yeah. Would um, hospitals in Connecticut, that they see people coming into the emergency room that obviously are, well, either addicted or overdosing or whatever, would they, would they typically send contact you or send them to you when they leave the, or suggest to people that they see you? Hmm. You would like to think so, right? Does it happen sometimes? Yeah, and I love it, because it's like, yay, we're talking to each other, we're helping each other, and the harsh reality is our ERs are overrun, we have people out in the hallway, fluids, oh, it's just marijuana, just get them out of here. I gotta take care of this guy who's crashing on fentanyl. Um, and it doesn't make it any less important. So I think making those connections is important. It is important to have a whole team involved, though, have therapists involved, have social work involved, have a primary care involved, have an addiction med involved, because all of those things are involved if you think about most people struggling with an addiction need all four elements. So is it happening? It is sometimes, and more. Um, is it as good as it could be? Well, I'm biased. As good as it could be to me is every single person coming in for a substance use problem is gonna see somebody about a substance use problem, right? Um, and unfortunately, it's not uncommon that by the time patients see me, I can look back and see 12 hospitalizations in the last year. You know, it's very common. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate of course, thank you.